journey on this earth. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of being her friend, her family, to know her, Lord, to be prayed for. Lord, we are here to remember her life, but we are here to honor you for all that you did for her and through her, the people that you reached, Lord, the people you've encouraged through her. So today, as we talk about our friends and remember the, the wonderful things, it is an honor to you that we do this. So we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Nathalie J. Smith is a resident of Moses Lake for over 25 years. She went to be with her Lord Sunday, July 1st, 2018. Nathalie was born June 20th, 1930, in Chicago, Illinois, to Walton and Clara Ware. Nathalie loved to sing. We know that. Nathalie loved to sing here at our church. She sang for special occasions in various nursing homes in Moses Lake. She loved to fish and camp, often going by herself. She enjoyed horseback riding, and she even enjoyed roller skating in her younger years. Not recently. Natalie earned a degree from the American Conservatory of Music in Chicago and made her debut there at the Civic Opera House, where she performed opera and classical music publicly until moving to California. She performed with large and small bands and even toured California, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington with a four-piece band. She also was a member of the Washington State Music Teachers Association. Natalie had a bachelor's degree in biblical education, which she earned in 1993. She also earned a master of arts degree, specializing in sacred music and women's ministry from Multnomah Bible College in Portland, Oregon, which she earned in 2004 at the age of 74. Natalie was preceded in death by three siblings and her daughter, Judith. She is survived by her brother, Larry Ware, sister Beatrice Baylock, Nieces Gloria Holridge and Andrew James. Four grandchildren and six great grandchildren. And that's not even all of it. But we are grateful for Nathalie's life. Let's take a minute and see how great thou art. No heartache shall come 
No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore. On that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day. What 
day, glorious day that will be. What a day, glorious day.
But I noticed her health was going down, and she needed both the sleep that the Lord, I told her, Natalie, the Lord is not going to get upset because you don't pray for these people. Because already, how many years have you been praying for these people? She said, for 20-some years. I said, I think the Lord already knows your list. <laughs> and he knows what their needs. And you know what? He wants, he gives us day to be up and doing our thing. And then he gives us night to rest. And Natalie, you need your rest because you're out. Her legs were swollen from sitting there for a long period of time. So eventually she died. And um, my heart, I'm going to miss her because she touched my life. And, and uh, she was, even though I'm white hair, and she did not have gray hair, so, but I mean, you can tell her gray hair. I said, you're my grandma, because I always wanted a grandma that I could go hug and talk to. And I could talk to her. We could talk. And uh, I love her. I learned to love her deeply. And we went to a... Um, she had told me that she did not see her family. First of all, she said, I said, who's your family? She said, I don't have any. And I said, you don't have no family, no brother, sister? She goes, nope. She was, you know. And I said, well, I know you have a father and a mother. Because you would be here. And so she said, after that, she told me how she was born in Chicago. She can even tell you what time she was born and what hospital. And then she told me she was six in the family. And I said, well, she finally, after telling me whatever she was holding on to, I said, you need to forgive, Manfred, because you can know the Bible. You can know all the scriptures, but you need to have a, a forgiving heart, a compassion. I said, I don't like it because I said, you sound like that Pharisee that knows the Bible, knows all the rules, but don't have compassion. And that's what Jesus came in the earth to forgive us because he knows that we sin and we need to be forgiving to each other. And I said, reading in the Bible, the prayer that the Lord gave us was our Father. And it states that we need to be forgiven. We need to forgive them so we can forgive others too, just like how we like to. And so I left her like that because I only took care of her three days out of the week. And when I came back, she said, you're right. And I'm saying, what am I right? And because I talked too much to Natalie, and I said too much. And she said, you're right. I need to forgive. And I said, praise God. And I said, she goes, I need to forgive my brother. And I said, give me the number. She said, I don't have it. I said, okay. I looked in in my Google, and I put his name. She gave me the name. And I said, what, he, how old is he? So I just, she told me exactly the date and the time, I mean, the month. And there it was, two people with that name. And it close to Seattle. And... Uh, of course, the 28 wasn't her brother, so the 77 year old, I said, I'm going to call, and it was a voicemail. She recognized his voice. And that's the beginning of going to these journeys with her to go see her family, to reunite with them, and we asked for forgiveness. And it was awesome to see that, that she hadn't passed so many years. Uh, they couldn't even remember what really was going, holding on to their bitterness or whatever. They couldn't forgive each other. But when she seen them, she was overjoyed. And that's when we came back from uh, Long Beach, she said, I want to go to Atlanta. And I'm like, okay, we're going to have to budget on this. And so we did. I made the uh, 
got the flights, and it was six months. I had no clue that she was getting, she was already getting sick. And so it was three weeks before we flew out, and I took her to the doctor, and he told me, he told her that she had cancer. And so I told him that we had a, fly, uh, a trip, and he goes, what's the reason? I said, it's to go see her grandchildren. And he goes, looks at Natalie, pat her in the hand, and said, you go and enjoy your trip. When you come back, we'll decide what we're going to do. And so I did. But in those three weeks, she started going down. But the Lord allowed us to go. No matter how difficult it was, we got there. She got to enjoy her family. And God is so good. You know, because I could see her going. And we got her back. And thank you, Wendy, for allowing Jenny to help me. Because I was going to go by myself. And we both needed two people to take care of her. And so I know the Lord. She's over there praising God. I told her the last time. She heard me telling her, okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna come tomorrow, but if Jesus comes to get you, don't wait for me, you go. <laughs> and I want you to sing hallelujah when you're getting into the gates. And so, and I just gave her a hug and I said, I love you. And so, I talked to her, one of her nieces, Gloria, and she lives in France, so she can't come home. And she has some good, uh, Natalie has one sister in her life. Her name is Beatrice. And I'm just going to read what she said to me. She said, early this month, my, mother, my mother's older sister, my aunt Natalie, passed away after a battle with cancer and other medical issues. My mother has been out of touch with my Aunt Nan for the past 20 years, odd years, for various reasons. Between sisters that I had never knew about, but as I remember, as I... Various reasons between sisters that I never knew about, but as I remember my time as a teen mom, I moved to Chicago to, to Reno, Nevada, to live with Aunt Nan. And my cousin, Judy, it was an adventure for me. Being a city girl, moved to a, the country. We arrived at this little house with a white picket surrounding a large garden. I asked my mother, which woman on the porch was my was her sister? Mom pointed her out. Then I first when I first laid my eyes at my aunt Natalie with the big her big sun hat, sunglasses, polka dotted sundress. She was lar larger than life itself, like a movie star in the Nevada heat. When I think of Nathalie, it is the only way I can describe her. A woman who embraced life in her life journey. She has done many things from uh, simply pro ice skating as a young girl, nightclub city after the war, to her final coming as a ordained minister. I will remember Aunt Nat's beautiful smile, her red, her bright red lips, her long white, long black wavy hair in the high ponytail to her waist, and a husky voice when she called my name, Gloria Jean, a, a wonderful people that touched the lives of us a many and well be missed and as legacy. Live your life as its full potential. You will be missed. Gloria Holdridge, your loving
wedding niece. And then she has another niece. Her name is Cookie and Monica. She said they went to her. They want her to be remembered by her bigger than life personality, her wit, her humor. Aunt Matt, you will be missed, but we know you have received not only your wings, but dancing shoes. Dance away, and we will all see you again one day. Love you. Thank you. We're going to take a minute to give you opportunity to give testimony. Some of my first memories is uh, is when she first got here. I remember going ice or uh, roller skating with her. I did go roller skating, and we went with the kids. And it was you know she there was nothing too big for an athlete. Nothing stopped her. She was always ready. She always and I got to be with her the day she died. And and we were playing Bill Gaither and Sayla and and the last song she listened to was. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And then in that song where Gloria Gaither sang, 
And one, then one day I'll cross that river, I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns. And that's the last song she listened to before she, she took her last breaths. And, and I told her I loved her and said goodbye and I walked out not knowing that she wouldn't be there when I got back. I thought I'll be right back and she was already gone. So she blessed our lives. I don't ever not remember knowing Mrs. Smith. And of course, I was under 21, so I had to call her Mrs. Smith. And once I turned 21, how can I start calling her Napoli? And she always loved my horses. And whenever she'd come visit, we'd bring the horses out, and she'd pet them and kiss them. And she always wanted to ride again. She'd always talk about how she, was, she wanted to ride. And so when my mom told me she had passed away, it was like I had lost a fixture in my life. She was always there. She was always around. But then, about five minutes later, I thought, I bet she's riding horses. <laughs> she's doing horse stuff. She's happy. And it just makes me happy to think that she's up in heaven doing what she loves. Two things about Natalie. Um, I can stand up here. Every time you called her, she would answer the phone, Jesus loves you. It didn't matter what time of day, it didn't matter who it was, you knew Jesus loved you. And the second thing was, she went to camp with us several years in a row down in California. She whipped those kids into shape, I'm telling you what. <laughs> one, one of the kids that she told her to do something, and she said, well, I'm 17, like, you know, I don't have to do that. And Natalie looked at her and said, well, I'm 71, so what does that tell you? <laughs> I, it was so funny. I just, yeah. But she was a blessing, and those kids loved her when they went to camp. And they always ask, is Natalie coming this time? So, um, but most of all, I miss her prayers. Yes. So. What I remember about Natalie is she could remember every name that she prayed for and she prayed definitely for each person and she knew what she was praying about she never forgot she always asked how is so and so how is so and so did he do this did he do that she just knew everyone in this church that had ever asked for prayer and it was sincere and one time she asked me can you we were doing a class together with some of the younger people in the church, and she said, "What do I? Would, so, would you guys pray for me? My list is getting so long, and I don't know how to organize it anymore." <laughs> <laughs> so we we kind of rallied and told her, "Well, maybe you could pray by the year, or or and just keep them. Maybe these people at night, and these people in the morning." But she just kept her list and kept right on praying. And so I appreciate her so much. She prayed for my grandchildren and we prayed for hers. Yeah. Anyway. What a perfect example for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Natalie was one of my piano students at Multnomah. before 94. And so, of course, when she graduated, and I lost track of her, and then I think it was in 2000, my husband and I moved to Gordon, and um, we got acquainted with the Liberty Quartet, and so we would come here, and uh, oh, we all who said like but that was, and uh, in fact, the last time that Liberty was here was the last time we saw her. And um, my husband also had a bad cancer, and so we would often meet in the oncology department. Um, but yeah, she was a blessing, you know, even back then in, uh, at Multnomah. And I, I seem to recall that she had a grandson or a great grandson living with her that she was helping to raise back then. And I was so impressed with that. You know, here she was going to school full time, and yet she was taking care of this. He was a grade school uh, kiddo at that time. And yeah, all the things you guys have been saying about her, you know how amazing she was. And she was amazing way back then, too. I only 
we knew Natalie for about a year and a half. Um, but Natalie and Karen were the first two people when I walked through the door there in uh, November of 16 that welcomed me to this church uh, that loved on me like I had been here forever. And that really started praying for my wife and grandkids. Uh, as soon as I got here, I told, told her what was going on. So hearing everybody say all the things that they said for the last 25 or 30 years, um, what a testimony to this woman. She was, uh, she was a prayer warrior. Uh, and I only knew her a short time and I really miss her. I haven't been at First Baptist for a while, but every time I ran into you need to come back, and I still prayed for you. <laughs> um, she helped me find my voice. I had a duet with her, and we worked together, and did a solo, my church only. Um, but she was a godsend to my daughter. Her first teacher here, and, um, and again, Miss Smith. Reminiscing about her after she passed, and she goes, she was such a godly woman and such an example, and it was just a blessing to her. As we've already said this morning, or this afternoon, is that Natalie's life is, we're here to remember that, but we're also here to honor God and all that He did through her. The testimonies we've had are her impact in our lives. It could have been different. We've even heard of things that Natalie had to work on at, in her 80s, getting back with her family, listening to the Spirit's conviction in her heart, and going and taking care of that. Whether it was on their part or on her part, following the Scripture, following what God tells her, and going and doing what she should. It's a blessing to hear that. So, we celebrate. We celebrate her life. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3-5, through 5, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are also in any affliction, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. It's comforting, isn't it? It's comforting to know that Natalie is in heaven. It's a comfort for us knowing that she, she has no more pain, that she can stand and sit whenever she wants. She can walk around. She's probably walking around. She probably won't sit for a lot of years. That's an encouragement. That's a comfort for us. And, and, and as it says there in 2 Corinthians, we have that comfort from the Lord. We, we know that from Him. It's a comfort for us to know the fact that she now stands where her heart has been for years. With her Lord in the presence of her Lord and Savior. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. See, Christ doesn't just give us life. He gives us life. That, it comes from Him. But the, the life He was talking about is the abundant life that we have in Christ. See, not everybody like Natalie, not everybody has given their life over to Christ. Not everybody has surrendered their will to Him and made Him their Savior. So He's talking to believers and He said, I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. The way we have abundant life is to give our life to Him. Part of that abundant life on this earth, and we've already heard the testimonies. Sounds like somebody read my nose, but she loved to go fishing and camping. And she would bring me the pictures. I'd show her pictures of the deer I killed, and then I would show her blank pictures because I didn't get one that year. And then she would show me her fishing pictures. And she said, I'll trade you fish for venison if you get it. And I said, okay, we'll do that. But she would go camping. We'd get the pictures back. We'd get to see those. I love the fact and I love all the testimonies of all the singing that she did. The different groups, the different choirs, the, the trios that she was singing with. She sang here often. We got to hear her. And, and even as her voice got older and older, it was still okay. 
was good to hear the praise of the Lord. And she sang about the Lord. Sang about her first true love. Natalie has several prayer lists. We've heard about the prayer lists. She had so many she couldn't even stay awake praying. And in one of the journals that she had, there were sheet, two sheets of paper. And this is not everybody. But a majority of you sitting here are on this list. Yeah. She prayed for my kids. She prayed that... Um, for not just strength, but she prayed for the salvation of the those she knew that needed that. She prayed for their, um, and I think the, the reason it took so much time is because she could remember, and the Lord gave her that. And the Lord gives it. If I can't remember, I should be writing it down, right? Because He told us to pray, and Natalie believed it. She did it. A couple things in her journal, right at the front, that she wrote. She says, "Speak without offending." Listen without defending. And she said, give others the sunshine and tell Jesus the rest. You know, that's, one, that's, a, that's good counsel. But as there, there are other times, aren't there, when we need to tell each other the rest too. I need to tell the Lord, but I need others. And Natalie was one of those people we could go to, we could talk with, and she would pray with us. She helped us bear the burden. She helped us carried some of that load. We've already seen it. She loved her nieces and nephews. She loved her grandkids. She even made a trip to see them. Didn't expect them to come see her. See, Natalie had an abundant life on this earth. But the, the key thing for her is that she prepared for the day when she would stand before the Lord in heaven and give an account of her life. She knew that day was coming as she prepared herself. In 1 Peter, in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 6, it said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. A living hope. Not a dead God that somebody worships or, worships or puts up an image, but a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, and it's kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. That's what Natalie knew. She had the hope of everlasting life in heaven. She had, she had surrendered her life to Christ and she knew what waited for her. She loved us. She loved being here. She loved the things she was able to do, but she looked forward to heaven even more. God guarded her. Think about that. How it says that God guards that by who, who by God's power are being guarded through faith. Our salvation is guarded through God Himself. Salvation from death and hell was waiting for her in heaven. See? What are we saved from? Like we talked about heaven. It's, it's a wonderful place. We're looking forward to going there. But she she remembered, she understood what God has seen her from. Natalie got to hear a lot of my funeral <coughs> messages. So she made a few requests. She said, wear that tie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can do that. She also wanted me to read this again. <coughs> For all of you who've heard so many of these messages and you've heard it before, you'll enjoy it again. It's the story of a woman named Martha. Martha's voice on the other end of the telephone always brought a smile to Brother Jim's face. She was not only one of the oldest members of the congregation, but one of the most faithful. Aunt Marty, as all the children called her, just seemed to lose faith, hope, and love wherever she went. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? This time, however, there seemed to be an unusual tone to her words. Preacher, could you stop by this afternoon? I need to talk to you. Of course. I'll be there around three. Is that okay? It didn't take long for Jim to discover the reason for what he had only sensed in her voice. As they sat facing each other in the quiet of her small living room, Martha shared the news that her doctor had just discovered a previously undetected tumor. He says, I probably have six months to live. Martha's words were naturally serious, yet there was a definite calm about her. I am so sorry to, but before Jim could finish, Martha interrupted. Don't be. The Lord has been good. 
I have lived a long life and I am ready to go. And you know that. I know, Jim whispered with a reassuring nod. But I do want to talk to you about my funeral. I've been thinking about it and there are a few things that I know I want. The two talked quietly for a long time. They talked about Martha's favorite hymns and the passage of scripture that had meant so much to her through the years. And the many memories they shared from the years Jim had been her pastor. When it seemed they had covered just about everything, Aunt Marty paused, looked at Jim with a twinkle in her eye, and then added, One more thing, preacher. When they bury me, I want my old Bible in one hand, and I want a fork in the other. <laughs> a fork? Jim was sure he had heard everything, but this caught him by surprise. Why do you want to be buried with a fork? I've been thinking about all the church dinners and the banquets that I attended through the years, she explained. I couldn't begin to come to them all. But one thing sticks in my mind. At those really nice get-togethers when the meal was almost finished and a, a server or hostess would come by to collect the dirty dishes. I can hear the words now. Sometimes with the best ones, somebody would lean over my shoulder and whisper, you can keep your fork. Do you know what that meant? Dessert was coming. <laughs> it didn't mean a cup of jello or pudding or even a dish of ice cream. You don't need a fork for that. It meant the good stuff, like chocolate cake or cherry pie. When they told me I could keep my fork, I knew the best was yet to come. That's exactly what I want people to talk about at my funeral. Oh, they can talk about all the good times we had together, that, and that would be nice. But when they walk by my casket and look at my pretty blue dress, I want them to turn to one another and say, why the fork? This is what I want you to say. I want you to tell them I kept my fork because the best is yet to come. Amen. If Natalie could stand here before us this morning, she would tell us, do not live life as though this world is all there is. Don't lose heart with all the grief and all the times and all, all the mess that is life. Don't lose heart. Look forward to the joy of the eternity that we have with Christ. I think if she stood here, she'd say, I've just spent three weeks with, with Jesus. And if I could tell you one thing, she would say, choose Christ. Now, the majority of us in this room have done it. But she would stand there, she would say, choose Christ. And, and think about your life after this life. Because the only thing that's dead is Nathalie's body. Nathalie uh, lives on. God is in control of all things. We know that. Nathalie lived it. So do most of us. God is in control of all things. And her, her death did not catch him by surprise. Your death will not catch him off guard. He knows exactly when that time is. And he knows when that will be. If we had your memorial service next week. For most of you in here, for many of you, we'd be able to say the same thing. You are with your Lord and Savior in heaven. But if it's the case that we would not be able to say that, that we would not have the joy in our heart of knowing that, that our hearts were broken because you had not surrendered your life to Christ, if you had not listened to the words that are spoken today or the testimony from Nathalie or from another friend, and we had your funeral and we could not say for certain, that you were in heaven. That you were separated from God in hell forever. Would that not, wouldn't today's message, wouldn't today's thoughts about eternal life with Christ, wouldn't that not encourage you to make that choice? To change your heart, change your mind? Because here's the thing, and we talked a little bit about that to be a little stubborn. You ever <laughs> notice that? <laughs> Sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a way that needed, we needed to apologize to each other, and, you know, in the stubbornness. Do you think that is stubborn? God said there's one way to get to heaven. He didn't give us many, He gave us one, but He gave us a clear path, clear view, clear understanding from the Word. This is the only way. Through Jesus Christ.
surrendering our life to Him, putting our faith and trust in Him. And because you still sit here breathing your next breaths, you have that opportunity. Most of you have done it, I understand that. You have that opportunity today to give your life to Christ. See, because each of us has an appointment with God. None of us are going to be late. We will meet Jesus, and you will meet Him as either judge, or you will meet Him as your Lord and Savior, as Natalie did three weeks ago. Lord, we thank You that You do not just give us physical life at birth, Lord, but You give us life everlasting in heaven with You. We thank You that we have that hope. We thank you that we can look at Natalie's life and rejoice knowing that she is with you today. We look forward to that day. And Lord, we pray for our friends and family who do not know you yet, who have not surrendered, who have not given their life. Lord, we ask that you will soften their heart, break their heart, that their will would become yours, and that they would follow you, serve you, confess their sins, be done with that life. Their hope would be heaven with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we can stand and sing Amazing Grace. I think that would be Thank you.